What's going on, my friend? I believe that this sermon that you are about to watch is going to radically change the way you handle money. Now, many people have money, but they don't know how to manage money. And so I want to help you to win in your finances. If this sermon is a blessing to you, I want you to subscribe. I want you to like and share it and then leave a positive comment about how this message impacted your life. I pray that at the end of this message, you will go to a whole nother level in the area of your finances with Christ. God bless. Well, today we are starting a brand new sermon series called Money Matters. Everybody repeat it with me. Money Matters. Okay. In part one, I want to start off by talking about money management. Let me see a show of hands of all those who are working. You are working some type of job right now. Okay. Okay. Most times your prayer is that God, I need me some more money. And God, can, can you bless me with some more money? But God blessed you with some more money, but your prayer today is still, God, bless me with some more money. And so I have concluded that most times for all of us, money is not the problem. Management is. I remember one year, my wife and I, we worked so hard. God, has ble God blessed us that year. We had, over a hundred, we had over six figures that year. And but yet still in the bank, I was like, where are all the money? <laughs> where are all the money? And God revealed to me that day, he said, son, part of the reason why that sometimes a bank account is so low, it's not more money you need, it's management. Are you hearing me? And you have been in the same situation over these years. God has blessed you financially. God has poured out money in your wallet. But every time you are still on the phone calling mommy and say, Mommy, can, I, can you send me $100? And you work good money. Somebody just raise your hand. That's me, Pastor. That, that, that's me right there. And God is saying that at this, in this season, I want you to take hold of management. Okay? The year you work $20,000 and you pray, God, give me more money. God gave you a job that now you are working $40,000, but yet still you have $0 in your savings account. The problem is not more money you need. The problem is lack of management skills. And so today I want to get right into it and so that we can learn how to take back management over our money. Some of you even think that, you know what, uh, part of the reason why I don't have any money is because my spouse is not working. You think that if your spouse starts to work enough money like you, then you will be able to have enough money as you need. But the thing is, your spouse is not the problem. <clears throat> The person you're in relationship with, that is not the problem. If your spouse is working even six figures, you would have still had an issue with money if you have an issue with $20,000 today. Why? Because of management. Lack of management. And so today I want us to learn some management skills through the Word of God so that we can take back management of what God has entrusted us with, okay? Uh, you'll be living from paycheck to paycheck if you haven't taken a money management course. Yeah. As my father would say, son, it's not how much you work. It's how much you save. My dad, I grew up seeing him riding a little daily bicycle. He was telling me the story the other day, and he said, son, I grew up riding a little bicycle. That's how I started out working. I bought me a little bicycle, and you know the seat, the seat on the bicycle? It was so hard that I would be leaning on one side riding, and I'd go on the other side trying to make money by selling peanuts. Then I watched my dad from selling peanuts, little by little, he saved up. Then he went and he bought himself a little bike, motorcycle, riding around selling peanuts from a bicycle. Then I watched him save and save and save, and he moved from a little bike 
till he, till he started to buy a little minivan. He bought a little minivan selling peanuts. I watched him driving around. Sometimes I followed him going around selling peanuts. And I watched him from moving from that little minivan. And I watched him go and he bought multiple vehicles having his own business. Running big transportation company in Jamaica. Coming with millions of dollars. Why? Because I've seen him save little by little by little by little by little even when people criticized him look at him riding down the lane with a little bicycle my dad didn't watch that he saved and he saved and he saved for the right opportunity and somebody is saying that God if you could just give me more money and God is saying that if you would just be a good steward over the little check you have right now I'll be able to elevate you to another level financially because the same practices and habits you have now is going to be the same practices and habits you will have later. So today, I have entitled this first part of our series, Money Management. Because your financial life is all over the place right now. And I want this message to help you become a better steward of what God gave to you. So turn, to, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, reading from verses 17 to 27, okay? Mark chapter 10, reading from verses 17 to 27. Okay, there was this rich young ruler who came running to Jesus who asked, here it is, Good teacher, what shall I do so that I may inherit eternal life? Are you with me? Are you with me, church? All right, you want, you want some more time? I hear the page is rolling now. It's on the screen. But, but Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. Ooh. Jesus showed, him, sh showed love to him and said to him, One thing you lack, though, little young rich ruler, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But he was deeply what? Dismayed by these words, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Here are some proven biblical principles to help you manage your money well. Write this down. Number one, evaluate how close you hold money to your heart. Write that down. I see some people writing it down. You're going to need this. Yeah, you are going to need this. I want to see you get well financially, for real, for real. There was nothing wrong with the rich young ruler having money. So, so I want you to get that clear. That him having money, nothing was wrong with that. Jesus did not rebuke him for being wealthy. Okay? The only thing the rich young ruler lacked was he allowed money to stand too close to his heart. Jesus then called him... To let go of what stands so close to his heart. And that God wanted to replace it with himself. You have to learn to ponder the proximity of pennies to your heart. How close is money to your heart? Whenever money is that close to your heart, it will become what defines you. Hmm. Money being that close to your heart becomes the voice that tells you who you are. We are already under pressure from the culture using our financial status to define us. You see, societal norms and cultural expectations and personal beliefs have caused some of you to use money to define you. You use your wealth and material possessions as markers of status and social standing. You purchase luxury items you live in affluent neighborhoods and you flaunt expensive positions to signal your success and social status to others. 
For some of you, your net worth or income level becomes intertwined with your sense of identity and self-worth. You equate how much money you have in the bank with your personal worthiness, leading to you feeling prideful or inadequate based on your financial achievements or failures. Money is often seen as a measure of success and achievement in modern society. You define yourself by your ability to accumulate wealth, climb the corporate ladder, or if they approved you for the five-bedroom house, or if you are reaching your retirement saving goals. You have allowed your financial status to measure your success. The rich young ruler had caused what he possessed to define him. Maybe the rich young ruler is you today. What you possess or do not possess has been what defines you. But today I want to tell you that your success or failure is not your identity. It's just an event. Getting your tax return was just an event is not who you are. Are you hearing me? Your primary identity is not based on what's in your wallet. Jesus doesn't see you as middle class or upper class. Jesus doesn't identify you based on what type of car you drive. Somebody needs to hear this. Don't let your wealth determine your worth. You are not defined by your wealth. You are not defined by your failures. You are not defined by your bank account. You are not defined by a stimulus check. You are not defined by your career. You are not defined by your circumstances. You are not defined by your neighborhood. You are who God says that you are. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a peculiar person. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are bought with a price. You are redeemed. You you are loved, you are called, you are a citizen in the kingdom of God. Amen. When God looks at you, he says that I claim you as royalty. And no money can define who you are. I thank God that even if I have $10 in my wallet right now, I'm still a child of God. God still sees me as, my, as his son. If you have $10,000 or if I have $1 million, it doesn't matter. God still sees you the same way he sees me. We are sons and daughters of God. And so God says that don't let money define you. Yeah, d d don't let what you have in your wallet make you feel like I'm a child of God today. Even if you have failed in money management, don't let that become the sum of who you are. Because the enemy's goal is to make you feel like because I messed up in finances, that means I'm messy. Or he makes you feel that because I've made so many financial or poor financial decisions, that I'm nothing. Because you have zero dollars in the bank account, you feel like, man, I am worth nothing. I'm just good for nothing. But Jesus is not looking at you as nothing. <laughs> Jesus is looking at you and saying, I paid a high price for you. Mm. I thank God that God looks beyond what's in our wallet. And he claims us as worthy. Not based upon what you have in the bank account but based upon his precious blood. Ooh. God is so good that he's saying that, son. Don't let money define you. Don't let the culture make you think that you are valuable because you have some money. Hmm? And so, as you go throughout the week, hear what? Hear what? There are some serious questions you have to ask yourself if you are going to be able to get out of the habit of poor money management. The first thing is that you have, to, you have to admit to yourself that I am not good with money management. <laughs> yeah, you have to come to the, to, to the place where you're like, you know what, I recognize over my, over my five years of working, I'm not that good with money. Maybe somebody didn't teach you how to manage money well. 
Maybe your dad or mom didn't train you or sit you down and say, here is how you manage money. Maybe you've grown, you have grown up thinking that God is going to be, God is a God who just loves poor people alone. So you feel like getting wealthy should not be anything that you should even try to think about. Because you're saying that, man, no, there's no way. I get my $100, and I'm going to see how I spend that money. And clothes, and more, different places. Nobody sat down with you and said, here's $100. Here is how you manage $100. Okay? So you have to admit, I'm not that good with money management. But write this down. Here is another one. You have to ask yourself now. Ask yourself these questions. Hear it. Hear it. After you admit that, here are some questions after you admit. Am I defining myself by how much money I have? Yeah. Are you writing down the questions? See, some people do it. Some people doing that. Some people are intentional. Okay. Somebody say, I'm going to watch it fast. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it. That's my plan, to watch it a lot. <laughs> Okay, here's another question. Okay, I see some people still writing, and some people watching online, and some people will watch the rebroadcast. Watch this. Can I still enjoy life to the fullest without having a fancy car or a big home? If you never got your dream home, if God never blessed you with your dream car, will you still be happy? <laughs> I see, I see the smile on your face. I'm like, he's like, whether I'm broke or whether I'm wealthy, I'm coming with a smile. Okay? You have to ask yourself that. Here's another one. Here's the other one. Here it is. How do I feel when I have to, when I have to let money out of my hands? When God, yeah, payday. On, on, on payday. What's your feeling after you let it go? Hmm? Somebody say, I don't want to let it go. Okay? You have to ask yourself that. What, how do you feel? And be honest with your feelings. Because what we want to do, by the grace of God, is that if Christ would call us like a rich young ruler, guess what? We'll let it go. Okay? We, we, we'll let it go. Here, here, here's another one. How do I react when I lose money? Because look at the rich... Young ruler, look at his reaction. Mark chapter 10, verses, verse 22 said, But he was deeply dismayed by these words, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. The reaction of the rich young ruler tells us how close money stood to his heart. His reaction was discouragement and grief. The original language gives us the best imagery by stating that his countenance fell, and he became sad. He was like, after Jesus said, okay, go sell all you have and come give it to the poor, his countenance was like, before he was like, Jesus, tell me, what, what, what do I need to do? What else do I need to do to get to the kingdom? Because I'm keeping all these commandments now. He was smiling, he was happy, but when Jesus said, man, I, I, you, I love you, I really love you. But one thing you like, just go and sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come back and follow me, okay? Then from that smile, like... Mm. <laughs> well. that, that, that was a rich young ruler. So when you lose money, what's your reaction? Do you start to call the person that you lost the money to? If you don't give me back my money, I'm going to kill you. Is that your reaction? <laughs> when the scammers call and steal your money, hopefully it doesn't happen to you, but there are so many scammers all over the place. If they do, God forbid, what's your reaction? Do you lose your character? Do you start a curse? <laughs> Uh -huh. Before you're talking to them like a good old Christian. But after you lost the money, you lost your mind. 
Does your countenance change? Hmm? It ain't no easy. I lost $500 to a scammer one time. I pray, I say, God send me that money. Right? <laughs> Hmm? But, but, but we, have to, we have to write these things down, okay? And be prepared so that money is not too close to our heart. Because it will affect our reaction. And some of us might react in a bad way to the point where you end up spending 25 years in the jail. Okay? So you want to identify, where am I when I lose money? What happens when I lose money? What triggers happen when it feels like I let go of money? Am I like the rich young ruler? I feel discouraged. I'm a countenance fair. I feel like, man, I'm sad. You write those things down and be honest with Jesus and say, Jesus, here I am. But here's your prayer next. Lord, help me so that I will not be in love with money. Nothing is wrong with having money. One day I'm going to deal with that. Nothing is wrong with what? The problem is when you love money. All right? All right, so let's continue here. So, so don't let what is in your wallet make you lose your joy, okay? Today, I want you to evaluate how close money stands to your heart so that God, through his power, can replace where it stands with himself. Now, while the rich young ruler was that was he that he had money too close to his heart? There are some things that I believe we can learn from him. This young ruler had great possessions. And don't want to think that Jesus has, I don't want you to think that Jesus has a problem with people having wealth. Look what the Bible says, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse, verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Did you see that? Jesus is the one who gives us the ability, the wisdom, the power to get money, wealth. In other words, God is the one who gives you and, you, you, you and me wisdom. Now, don't you go home thinking that God wants you to be poor. That's a poverty gospel. Some people preach the prosperity gospel, but neither is found in the Bible. God talks about the purpose gospel. That's where he gives you the wealth for purpose. He gave Abraham wealth for purpose. He gave people in the Bible wealth for purpose. So God gives it to you. He gives you the wisdom to get it, and that's okay. God expects you to use the wisdom he has given you to get wealth. If he has given you the wisdom to know how to flip houses, or to rent properties, or to open businesses, or become an entrepreneur, then use what God has given to you. <laughs> Some people think that money is evil, but no, that's a false reading of the text. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Notice that Paul did not say the love, that money is the root of all evil. But he said the love of money is the root of all evil. And Paul says that some people covet after this. Notice that Paul did not say everyone covet after it. Which means that not everyone who is wealthy is unrighteous. You can be rich and righteous at the same time. I hope somebody is getting this thing to me. Okay? One person said that we need more rich people to become righteous, and we need more righteous people to become rich. Because why? Money in the hands of a person who is not righteous what do they do? <laughs> they create a lot of evil. Hmm? But money in a, right, in a person with a righteous hands and heart, they will make a big impact in the world. 
You'll see feeding program happening. We'll be able to buy our community center in no time. We'll be able to renovate this whole church. We'll do, uh, we'll do so many things. We'll go to Africa, feed the people there, go to our neighborhoods. We can change the whole trajectory of the neighborhoods. Are you hearing me? So God sometimes will raise up a rich person. Now notice that God is the one who gives wealth. So not everybody God has called to become rich. So if you're not rich, if you're not wealthy, again, don't let that define you. Are you hearing me? It's a calling. And no matter how much money you have, for you to continue to have a level of wealth, you have to learn something. Here is it. Number two, write this down. Cultivate a habit of cash control. I am assuming that the rich young ruler had to have a, he had a lot of cash. Okay? He had a great position, the Bible said, great positions. But he had to have a habit of cash control in order for him to maintain wealth. If he couldn't control his cash, then he wouldn't be able to possess wealth. When you cultivate a habit of cash control, you are submitting yourself to living, to living on a written budget. Mm. Are you hearing me? Most people are thriving financially with what God has blessed them with because they have a written budget. The Bible says in Luke chapter 14 and verse 28, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? Whether he has enough to finish it. Before you start spending, you need to count the cost. This is a way of getting your finances back in order. If you keep spending without counting the cost, your finances will be out of order. Then you will eventually start to spend what you don't have. Don't answer this question. If you are working for a company, and the company is called you, and you company hired you to be in charge of their money, the way you handle money now, if you were the manager, would you fire you? <laughs> the way how you handle money now, would you fire you? This just means that you need to learn how to better manage money. I'll just hear about four, four notes. Okay? Which means that most of us in here need to learn how to manage our money. Some cash control. What if God wants to promote or call you to manage a multi-million dollar business, but he can't promote you yet? Because he sees how you manage money in your home. Some of you are mismanaging money and praying for God to send you a bigger promotion. But God is looking at how you manage what he is giving you now. You're like, God, I'm making $70,000 per year in this business. But God, I want this to start to make $7 million. And God is like, really? You aren't even managing the $70,000 well. And you want $7 million. If I, if I bless that business to have $7 million right now, it will all be gone. It will hurt your business more than how it would bless your business. So God is looking at you and saying that I'm watching this year how you are going to have cash control. How are you going to control the cash that God is sending your way? And when God sees that you are managing that well, you know what he does? He adds to it. Remember the talents? Even though it's not dealing with money, but look what God, God sees with stewardship. The principle is stewardship in the parable. How do you steward the five talents you have? How are you stewarding 
the, the, the 10 that you have? How are you stewarding the one that you have? And when God sees that you are going and investing it and you are trying your best to save, you're trying your best to do something positive with that money, God comes and says, oh, all right, to you, I will double it. I'll take five more and give to you the, who had the five. You have ten now. God sees how you are managing in the small areas of your life. Okay. Then God says, I'm going to pour out more in your life. You see, sometimes promotion comes from being faithful in the little things. I said that because of some of you are like, I don't need a budget because I only work $2,000 per month. He said $200 go, goes to tithe, $100 goes to offering, $900 rent, $200 car note, and some groceries, some Netflix, some for internet, and it's done past. And you are walking around with a mental budget, but God is saying that, no, you need a written budget. Not the one in your head where you don't know where every single dollar is going. Are you hearing me? You see, when my wife and I started to budget, it changed our lives for the better. We budget, start budget every penny that comes. Okay? Because what will happen is sometimes when, when we just started out in our marriage and I'm like, okay, I have a mental budget. I know how much is coming in. Okay, when I go to the store, I buy a shirt. The next thing you know, or I buy this or I buy something, I come back and we're over budget. Because I thought, oh man, I thought, I thought, I thought that bill was coming next month. <laughs> Are you hearing me? And then you find yourself in a place where you're, you, you're, you're questioning, oh God, what, what's going to happen now? How are we going to figure this out? But when you have a written budget, you can budget and say, this is your allowance. So your spouse has an allowance. You have an allowance. This goes to the rent. This goes to the mar or this goes to the mar mortgage. Or this goes to the car note. Or this goes to the phone bill. And every month, you have that budget that you are working from. So when you go to the mall, you can spend freely knowing what's in your budget. Are you, are you hearing me? That's when you can buy the Jordan as you feel like because you look at what's in your budget. That, that's when you can just buy a shirt that you like when you go into J.C. Penny because you look and you see it in your budget. And you don't feel bad about it because you put aside that for your saving for yourself. Are you hearing me? Okay, so, so I'm challenging you to have a written budget so that you can gain cash control. Now, just, just going with the flow is not going to help you to have control over your cash, okay? Because if you just have that mental budget, you will walk into, you'll walk into like I walk into, what's his store name again? Target. You'll walk into Target and they will say, come on in. And then you go to the front desk and then the next thing you know, they're saying, if you, if you take out this credit card, you'll get 5% off. Yeah, you get 5% off. And you're like, oh, really? 5% off? I could get that right there. They run your credit, and uh, when they run it, they affected your credit score. You put that on your card, and then you're like, wow, you gave me $3,000? You mean I can shop with $3,000? And then you are like, wow, I have $3,000. And then what you find yourself doing, you never planned it, but now you have the card. Every single week, guess where you're at? Target. You are at Target putting something on that card. The next thing you know, you are at your max $3,000, and you're not even working $3,000 per month. This is the reason why having a written budget is going to help you so that you will know what you can do and can't do. You're like, I can't afford it. It's not in my budget to take out that card. So having a written budget is very, very important because you have people right now who are studying how you think. Are, are you hearing me? I'm trying to help you. You have people right now who are studying how you think. And they know you more than how you know you. You see this thing called social media? Or technology? It is where they track everything that you do. They see when you pause. Okay, oh, she paused when she saw this dress. 
That means she must like this type of dress. The next thing you know, it's on, that same dress is on Facebook, it's on Instagram, it's on TikTok. It's everywhere. <laughs> Until you purchase that dress. <laughs> because they're tracking how you spend. So that means that you have, in this culture, if you are going to make it, you have to have written budget. You, 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 have to, you have to have a written budget. You have to sit down and plan it out and just say, yep, no, that dress looks nice, but that, that's, that's $59. I only have $20 this month. I only have in my budget. I know it's tough, but I only can visit Smooth the King this month. I only can get $10 smooth. That's it. And be okay with that. Now, if you want that dress, what you can do is, okay, it's cost $60. What I'm going to do with this $20, save this $20 for three months. <laughs> somebody said, somebody said, Pastor, you're talking to me. <laughs> Quinta, save that $20 for six months. Okay? And, and that's it. You have, you have it right there. Because what will happen is, when you don't have a budget, you, you have what I call pop-up bills. Mm. They come out of nowhere. They just pop up. Mm. Like, where did this come from? That's a hospital visit that you did a couple years ago and you forgot about it. And here it is, they just got the time to send it to you. You need to pay this. Mm. Pop-up bill, when you're driving down the highway, you're late for work, you get a speeding ticket, you have to go in to pay that $300. That's a pop-up bill. Where are you going to get it from? If you didn't have an emergency fund. Hmm? Hmm? They said they're going to get it from Ella Walker, they said. Ella Walker, they're going to get it. Say, I'm going to come and beg Ella Walker. <laughs> Say, Ella Walker, I was in trouble this week, Ella Walker. The cops got me on Ella Walker. But there are pop-up bills that come in life that all of us, most of us, we get pop-up bills. Okay? But you have to budget so that you have something there. What if you need to go to the hospital and what you're going to the hospital for, your insurance does not cover that. And you have to pay the copay and you have to pay all of these money right up front. So you have to put aside something little by little so that when you're having neck pain, back pain, and you're wondering what's happening, no, 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 just, just if I sleep tonight on this side, it'll get better. No, go visit the hospital. Don't just wait to see, okay, I'll figure it out. Go visit. But that's how you will, you will be able to do that freely when you budget for that. Are you hearing me? So having a written budget will help you Cultivate a habit of cash control. My wife is very good with this, and she recommends this, and it was working for us. It's everydollar.com. You can go there, everydollar.com. It's for free, and you can start budgeting every single dollar that you, that you have. Every, sing, every month, you can go there, you can change it, tweak it based upon how much God blesses you each month, and you plan it out like that. And try it for the next six months and see how your life is changed. Your life will be transformed. See, if you are single, still have a written budget. Some of you are looking like, no, 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 that's for married people, Bryce. <laughs> but no, if you are single, still have a written budget. It's going to help you as you're practicing this. So by the time you get into marriage, you have a system that is working for you. Are you, are you hearing me? So that you know that you can live on your own with the help of God by yourself budgeting well with what you have. Then when you combine two checks together and you continue that same system, you will start to see some cash in your account. Are you hearing me? But number three, write this down. In order for you to manage your money, you have to divert from drowning in debt. This is a big one. Some of you don't recognize that you have been drowning in debt. You keep taking out more and more debt without giving, without giving you any return. See, some people take out 
loans wisely. But some people, when they take it out, no plan. They just take it out for pleasure. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 7 says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. When you borrow, you become a slave to the person who gave you the money. While borrowing is not a sin. Hear me out. While borrowing is not a what? Sin. Having too much unnecessary debt can make you feel like you are drowning. Though You feel like water is up to your neck. And every time you are driving, every time you are going to work, every time you are laying down, the only thing you are th thinking about is, man... I have too much money to pay back. I have to pay back him. I have to pay back her. I just borrowed some money from him. I just borrowed some money from my co-worker. I just borrowed some money from my dad, from my mom, from my brother. And what you find out is they are calling you. And when they're calling you, you're like, man, I ain't picking up this. Because you know what they're calling for. Like, bro, you owe me that $200, man. What, 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 what am I going to get my money? It, when, when am I going to get the money back? And now you guys are in war because you are borrowed too much that you can afford. So you're drowning in debt and the next thing you're wondering, okay, who else can I call to borrow some money? I, I borrowed from everybody I know. So, okay, yep. When I go to F Guess How Many, ah, or those who are watching from Ebenezer, when I, when I go to Guess How Many Ebenezer, I'm going to borrow some money from Valencia in the bank. <laughs> I, I, I'm about to borrow some money from Anora and Amanda. Yeah, going to borrow some money from Quinton. Yeah, that Quinton has a fancy car. Going to borrow some money from them. That's your plan. To get more debt. Oh yeah, I'll pay you back. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'll pay you back. I'm going to pay you back. That's the reason why you're watching online. Because you borrowed some money. And now you feel bad when you come to church and see them because you can't pay back. <laughs> if I had the power, I would say forgive it. <laughs> come on to church, forgive it. But God is saying that that habit of you drowning in debt, being so comfortable in borrowing, 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 borrowing for everything, God is saying that you have to limit that. You have to limit how much you borrow and start paying back, <laughs> paying back your debt, okay? You, you, you are borrowed so much to the point where you don't have no time to press pause. You have no time to rest. So you work two, three jobs. To pay back debt. From the moment you went to college, you took out so much money, so much students, so many students' loans, until today you are 66 and you're still paying back student loans. Let that sink in. Notice that you have been working, 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 working. You went to school, that's good. But you've been working, 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 working for so many years. You can't see no benefit of it. Every penny, every check is going back to all those people that you took out loans from. And you are still thinking to go and take out more loans. Yes, the BMW looks nice. It looks attractive. But you might have to settle for a Honda. You might need a Honda Accord or a Honda Civic or a Toyota Corolla or, or a Ford or something. You cannot afford the BMW. Oh, I'm speaking to somebody. Don't look at your sister and say, look at what my sister has. My sister has, she has three cars and I only have a little 2013 Toyota Corolla. And God is saying that you keep driving that 2013 Corolla even when you have to bring it to a mechanic to get it fixed every now and then. Still do it because you have too much debt. You are going to sacrifice being wealthy for looking wealthy. And God is saying to you, 
that it's not worth it. This is where you are right now. And you can get to where he wants you to be if you just follow the simple biblical principles that we are outlining here at Gethsemane to show you that there is a way out. And that way out, God is saying that I want to help you to get that way out. Don't you think that God has left you or abandoned you because you have all of these debts? God is saying that, no, I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. If you take heed to the word of God, God will help to pull you out of debt. When you make up your mind and say, God, you know what? Hmm, I want to come out of debt. I'm going to have a budget. God, I need your help. It's too much, God. It's weighing me down. I can't even buy this for my great-grandmother. I can't even buy this for my mother. I can't even buy this for my spouse. I can't even buy this for my cousin when their birthday comes. Because I have so much debt, God. I can't even visit this person. I can't even visit my grandchildren. I can't even do this because debt, 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 debt. But the moment you say, God, help me. Help me, Lord. Please, help me. I just heard a story this past week. Somebody prayed that prayer. They had $160,000 in student loans. Mm. They prayed the prayer. They said, God, man, I've been teaching this, and I'm still drowning in debt. I've been teaching debt-free life. I've been teaching budgeting. I've been teaching God, please. I, I want to be free. He said by the time he finished praying the prayer, he got an email that they forgave his student loans. Mm. I said, praise be to God. Did somebody say what exact words did he yeah, pray? <laughs> yeah. He said, give me the exact words. <laughs> give me the exact words. <laughs> but God, God can do it. Okay? God, God can help you. God wants to help you to be able to become debt free. But you have to practice it by the grace of God. You can't go to TJ Maxx all the time. You can't go to Foot Locker all the time and buy five ear mats. Are you hearing me? You, 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 you can't be buying shoes upon shoes and clothes upon clothes all the time. As soon as you get the paycheck, we're at the mall. The mall is where we're at. As soon as you get the paycheck, you're online. God is saying that if you are going to be debt free, you have to learn through his spirit to have some cash control. Okay? You have to have some cash control and say, God, it's going to be sacrificial. It's going to, it's going to pay in my heart when it's like, I can't, I can't get that. I can't get that. But it's going to be for your freedom. There's a time and place for everything. If you have debt, hear this, set up a plan to get out of it. Okay. Yeah, set up a plan to get out of it. Hear this, you can start to pay off your small debts and then work on your larger debts. Are you listening? Okay. Are you, are you can work on paying off those with higher interest rate first. Or you can use your tax return and sacrifice whatever you can instead of spending it on upper rows. You can make a commitment to bring lunch with you to work instead of going to the restaurant every day. Not every day you have to go to Starbucks. <laughs> if you say that, God, I'm going to bring breakfast or lunch, whatever you choose, I'm going to bring a meal a day to work. I'm going to heat it up. I'm going to heat it up, Lord. They're going to watch me bring in meals to work, but that's fine. I'm not going to be able to go out with my friends to lunch every single time. But I'm going to bring my lunch to work. For the next six months, I'm just going to save that $10 I used to buy lunch with. Okay? If you do that for one week, saving $10 for five days, how much money you have? $50. If you use $50 for a month, four weeks, how much is that? 200. We have some mathematicians in here. Good job. That's $200. That's a lot of money, Nora. $200 you're able to save just by just bringing lunch to work. That's it. 
You bring lunch to work, you save all of that money, you put aside debt to pay off some debt. $200 for the next six months. That's a long way. That would, that would cancel a lot of your credit card debts as well. Okay? Why? Because debt is causing you to lose your smile for a long time. Yeah. I like it, it, it doesn't feel good to be in debt. Uh, now, unnecessary debt. Okay, let me, let me make sure I fix that up. Unnecessary debt, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. It makes you sometimes lose your smile. Hey, Amen. Just got that bill. Here comes another bill. I thought I, thought I had that credit card paid off, but here comes another thousand dollars. Oh, why did I buy that? Uh, I only wore it one time. Man, they don't have to pay all of that money back. Oh, I just bought that expensive car for $60,000. But here comes somebody scratch my car. It doesn't look good anymore. Now I have to go pay on top of that $60,000 because I was the one who was wrong. I have to fix my car, his car. My insurance is now up. It's higher. Oh, boy. And then you're like, God, what's going on? And God is saying that sometimes we have to learn to sell some things. <laughs> I know this is a hard word. That's why you ain't clapping, you ain't smiling, you're just looking at me, but I know you're getting it. I know you might, don't, you might not like me today, but it's okay. Because I want you to be free. I know you guys just had a conversation. What if we bought that BMW? What if we bought that BMW? But you might go back and have that conversation again. You might have to go back and have that conversation. Man, we listened to Pastor Nelson. Why did we go to church today? Some of you are like, why did I come to church? Oh, yeah, I'm talking to you. Because God wants to save you from what the enemy is trying to get you in next. So you have to, maybe you have to go sell some things on eBay. Okay, maybe the 30 days have gone already. <laughs> you bought those shoes. You bought those expensive dress. Huh? You bought that PlayStation. You bought all those games because the new 2K came out. New Fortnite. You're like, man, I need a PS5. I say you might have to bring it back because you just put your mama in debt and your mama she, had, she is 88 and where is she going to get the money from bro she's going to work at 88 years old she has to go now go find a job to work for playstation 5 and God is saying that man no man you have to learn to save some stuff because it's going to help you to have a better life. Here's my next point. Here's it. I'm flying through this one now. I'm done. Number four. To learn to foster high-quality relationships or friendships. Okay? Foster high-quality friendships. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 says, Do not be conceived. Bad company ruins good morals. The company you keep can make you abandon healthy habits. You had a habit of sticking to the budget, but then that friend of yours says, let's go to the mall to see what they have this week. Next thing you know, you went to the mall, you're buying this, you come, you come out with four bags from the mall. You didn't go to the mall to spend no money, but you're coming out with four bags of things because of the friends. Now, if your friends are always sending you coupons, girl, bro, man, they came up with this man, but here's a $10 coupon, I know it costs $500, but here's $10 off, it sounds like a good deal, but the deal is going to put you into debt, because you don't have the money, you have to be careful of the friends you have, I mean, they, they, might, they have good, good concern, is that they don't know how to, how to manage their money, 
And if those are the friends that you have who don't know how to manage their money, who are always spending your money, guess what you are going to do? You are not going to know how to manage your money. You are going to always spend your money because that's the friends you have. Okay? Nothing is wrong with your iPhone. Somebody said, keep it. I'm glad you said it. Nothing is wrong with the iPhone you have. It's working. It's taking good quality pictures. <laughs> Somebody's like, it's working very good. It's not freezing. But your friends are saying, you need the latest iPhone. You need to go get the new one. You go, you take out the latest iPhone, now you're back again in debt again. But God is saying that the friends that you have, it will ruin good morals, good habits that you have. It can ruin it. So you have to be careful. I'm not saying that throw them away. Still have them, but you have to maybe limit how often you spend time with them. Are you hearing me? You need friends who will build you up. Even though you might not like what they're saying, but when they say that, you know what, I think it's a good idea if we go eye shopping. <laughs> eye shopping. That's where you put stuff in the cart, you pack up all the things you, you like, and then go and put them back. <laughs> do, do you hear me? That's called eye shopping. Michael, did you do some eye shopping? No, he said no. He said, I do custom, customs, <laughs> customs all the time. You, you, you have to do some eye shopping. Whatever you have to do to replace that from spending, you can still bond in other ways, but don't spend all the money you have. Are you hearing me? This is not for anybody, this is for online. Let me talk to you for online. If every time you get the check and you're going to the wig store, you're going to the salon, and you're getting the Brazilian wig all the time for $950 for the Brazilian wig saying, I want to look Puerto Rican. Look at me. I look Puerto Rican. <laughs> but you are, you are broke Puerto Rican. Huh? You look Puerto Rican, but you're poor. <laughs> <laughs> and God is saying to you that if that's you always getting nails and hair and everything done to look like you are from Colombia God is saying that you might have to cut down on those things alright yeah let your friend continue doing that your friend might can afford it <laughs> Unless your friend is about to buy you that wig. If your friend buys you a wig, no problem. No problem. But if the little money you are working, if you are going to take half of the check to follow your friend, to get your hair done in that style, you might have to start to learn to go on YouTube to get your hair done. For the next six months, Mike, Mike said he needs a hair done. Anybody, any barber in here? Mike's hair is easy to cut. I do it. Okay, see Anora after service, she will help you out. <laughs> All right? So, so you, you have to learn the friends that you are surrounding yourself with and say, God, send me good friends. Send me better friends to build me up. Okay? Number five, be intentional about saving and investing. You hear me? For the rich young ruler, God called him to make a sacrifice. The sacrifice was to sell all he had and give to the poor. But hear what? For you, God might be calling you to make the sacrifice of saving. I know it's a sacrifice, but he's calling you to save. He, he, he doesn't want you to spend it all. God wants you to save and invest. Hear this. If you don't believe me, come here, wise man. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling. But a foolish man devours it. If you get everything and you just want to spend it all away, why is man saying that's a foolish thing to do? But when you have treasure and all, when you can save up some things, that's wise. 
I'm not going to spend all today. There are rainy days ahead. I'm going to save up some for a rainy day. If you don't believe me, look at um, Joseph. Look at his plan. Oh, he set up a plan to save and invest. When everybody around, they're crying, where are we going to get food from? God gave Joseph wisdom to save for seven years <laughs> for when the rainy day came. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11 says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. That's what my dad did. Little by little. Don't follow those pop-up things that come on your phone about, okay, give us $20 and we'll make it, make, we'll make it into $20 million for you. <laughs> you hear me? Don't follow. Or your friend just came to you, oh, if you come in this group, girl, we have this group that is going on. Man, they told me if I put $100, by next week I get 500 be careful. Be careful of quick cash. <laughs> okay? Be careful of quick cash. All right. Proverbs 21 verse 5 says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. So God's principle is slow. Might not be quick. You might not get out of debt by tomorrow. It's going to happen maybe little by little. You might not be able to drive that BMW by next year. But maybe one day, if you are a good steward, God will bless you with it. But you have to do it little by, by little. Okay? Here's the last thing. Number six and I'm done. Be boundless in kindness. You want to learn to manage money well. Be boundless in kindness. After you do those five things by God's grace... Be boundless in kindness. God was calling the rich young ruler to be boundless in kindness. He said, I want you to sell it all. Give it all away to the poor. You see, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 7 says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver this text does not mean that God doesn't love you even if you don't give a lot for the rich young ruler God still loved him God loves all of us but when we do give it encourages okay it encourages God to do something in the supernatural. He said, when you sow what you sow, you're going to reap. God said to this rich young ruler, when you give bountifully, guess what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to give back to you more. He said, I'm going to give it all, and I'm going to give you treasure in heaven. When you do those type of sacrificial giving, don't think that God is just saying, I want you to be poor. He promised his brother, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you beyond what you can even afford down here. God was not going to leave him alone on the street. God said, no, come to me. Follow me. I'm going to take care of you. Do that. Watch what I'm going to do for you. Here was Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. No matter what God calls you to give, he will ensure that your needs are supplied. Don't be afraid of generous giving because generous giving is an opportunity to see the move of God. When you give generously, because generous giving will allow you to be able to see how God works in the supernatural. When you give generously and give out of the abundance of your heart cheerfully, God is going to make sure that you are lacking in nothing. You see, the leaking of your roof should have cost $25,000. But when you give bountifully, God will work out a way where somehow it costs only $50. Are you hearing me? 
God will work out a way. When you're giving sacrificially, it might not return in cash, but it will return in something else where you are like, this is nothing but God. Mm. David said, I was young, but now I'm old, and I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. David has experienced the wonderful, merciful act of God in supplying all his needs. When God called David to do anything in abundance, he knew that God was also going to take care of him. You see, the level of generosity that Jesus was calling the rich young ruler to was something that Jesus had already done. Mm. Wow, look at this. Jesus is a most generous person. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, You know about the kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor in order to make you rich through his power or through his power, poverty. Jesus gave up all so that you would become rich. Jesus sacrificed heaven so you could get heaven. Jesus gave up walking on the streets of gold to walk on dusty path for you. Jesus valued you more than money. Jesus saw the need to win your heart more than having honor, wealth, and even the praises of angels. Jesus emptied himself. Jesus was willing to bankrupt heaven so that he could win your heart. Jesus is saying to all of us today, no matter where we are, he wants us to manage our money well. The media team can play me, play me something, play me something. What God is saying to all of us today is that, yeah, it's a tough word because we like to be in control. Let's do things freely. Go ahead, spend as we feel like. But God is saying to all of us today, that might not be the best way of living your life. There is more for you. Don't look at the man who is driving the BMW and did it in the right way, saying, look at them, they're all going to hell. No. Didn't say that the rich, all of them going to hell. God gives the power to get wealth. And some has activated the wisdom of God so that they, knew how, they know how to manage their money well. Little by little, they open a little business, it grows, they manage that well. Now they move from one KFC to two KFCs. Now they move to three. Now they move to having it in multiple cities. They just know how to manage their money well. God is saying that he wants more for all of us. If we learn to just manage our money well, you, could have, you can move out of the property you have right now, renting and paying rent to somebody else, paying their mortgage. God said, I can give you wisdom to know how to own your own house. God can give you wisdom to own multiple homes. God can give you wisdom how to manage what you have right now to the place where you own your own business. This season, God is saying that I want to test you in the small things, the little things. And I want to see how you manage this over the next Manage what you have well. And if this, this is you, you're saying that I'm, I'm, I'm up for that challenge. I'm taking up that challenge. I want to take management over the money that God has given me. Stand to your feet. Those online, I want you to type, type in the chat. If you, if you believe this word, just type in the chat management if you agree with this word you want to take back management type in the chat management or for some of you you just write M M 
I'm taking back management. What I want to challenge you to do to this week is to ask Jesus to help you with managing your money because you're going to need some help. Jesus says, or Paul says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. You are going to need some strength to overcome some temptations. When it feels like, man, I could just spend here, spend there, spend there, spend there. Take out credit cards from here and there. You're going to need some strength to help you to say, it's tempting, it looks good, but it's not for me. Number two, ask Jesus to replace the love of money with loving him. God, I want to love you more than how I love money. Maybe this is you and you're saying that, man, this is me. I'm, I'm in a place where I just need Jesus. I don't know everything and God has been calling me. But this message today is just a confirmation that I need more of Jesus. If this is you, you want more of Jesus and you want to give your life to Christ, I'm going to give your life to Christ today by saying that, God, I want to go all the way in. Just raise your hand. You want to give your life to Christ. You want to give your life to Christ. I see those hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. You want to give your life to Christ. You say, God, here I am. I want to give you all of my heart, Lord. I want to be baptized, God. I want to go all the way in. I, 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 want, I want to give, you the, give it to you all, God. Just raise your hand. Just wave it. Where, where are you? If you're online, just type in the chat, B for baptism. B for baptism. Just say, God, here I am. At this moment, we are going to pray. If you would like more for the series that is coming up on Wednesday, text money to 252-408-4447. That is 252-408-4447. Father, seal the decision of all those who are in here today. Help us, O oh God, to take back management of the money that you have blessed us with. We want to be faithful stewards. In Jesus' name, let everybody who believes say amen.